I like to start with the end in mind in having this conversation. Uh, this is just basic change management sort of stuff, but I think that it's important for us to understand where we go in terms of A&D professionals or folks uh, at the customer location. What we want to try and do is this, is, this is just your basic change management sort of formula here. Uh, the idea is that w the vertical line, what's placed in black, is a duration of time, and the dip in the red is your productivity. So we just have to be on board and understand that productivity will have a dip when change happens. It's, it's just going to happen. So we need to be okay with that. Everybody needs to be okay with that. The idea that there will not be a, a dip in productivity is, is not possible. So the idea in terms of using data, creating a methodology, building the, the course is that we want to minimize the time that it takes to change, and when that happens, the dip in productivity can be minimized. So our goal for the conversation today is to minimize the time frame and to lessen the dip. So we want to move this as far up as, as we can for our customers. So that's the thought into why we need to have this discussion overall. Uh, the other thing that we need to think about always for our is what's in it for me, that sort of with them, if you will, because they could care less about anything other than what they're going to get out of this opportunity for the most part. So it's important to have that sort of in mind when we're thinking about things in terms of a discussion of of the opportunity that's available for, for the individual. And I say the individual, not the organization as a whole, but every individual needs to be able to understand what's in it for them, for their opportunity. And we'll do a deeper dive in that uh, when we go through change management. So one of the things that we find uh, is that it's important for us to think about this sort of discussion, realigning the space in a way that better supports the way that people are actually working. So throughout all of this research investigation, what we tend to find, what many of you probably already know, is that the space is great for the way that work was done five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but is not working, and we'll prove that through data, for the way that work is happening today, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And so that's the issue that we think resonates with many of the clients in terms of the what's in it for me discussion. Uh, so from a Druckerin sort of state here, this is my bit of formula that I wanted to, to share. Um, the idea is that we want not just to control real estate costs, but we also want to create great spaces, right? So it's not an, it's not an either or, it's a both and conversation. And I'll sort of use that as my go-to reference from time to time. Um, the thought here is that when we're able to measure uh, the space, the way that it's being utilized, the other opportunity is that we we want to continue to monitor it. So think about when you go to a doctor to have your annual or six month sort of health checkup. Uh, we may not be thrilled to go and visit the doctor, but it is quite necessary. And that way we find out sort of what's working, what's not working, what we can improve on. So I like to think about this conversation when we think about what's around the corner, having that conversation with our doctor in order to promote our well being. The same thing happens with the real estate and sort of monitoring the space to determine the, the well-being of the real estate. So uh, does that make sense in terms of the logic train sort of approach to that? Okay. So when we do all of this, when we're able to measure the space and then continue to monitor it over time, we think that the organization can then, not, not us as Herman Miller or the dealership, but the organization can harvest the dollars that may not be used to their maximum ability, harvest those dollars, and then reinvest them in another opportunity. Now, it would be great if they use that money to reinvest in Aeron shares, but they certainly don't have to, right? What we want to make sure the organization does, uh, very honestly, is that they're focused on the needs of their organizational business drivers, okay? So the idea that they can reinvest, for one of my clients, it was being able to reinvest in technology, which is severely outdated uh, for them out on the West Coast, which is quite challenging for them in terms of getting lots of uh, new talent to work, particularly in an IT situation. So for them to be able to harvest those real estate dollars, 
dollars, they could then use that money to support infrastructure, in this case technology, for the organization as a whole. So that's what I'm getting to in terms of harvesting and then reinvesting as it makes sense. And it may not be for real estate, it may not be for tables and chairs. That's fine, as long as it's built on the needs of the organization and where they're wanting to go five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So that's the idea. If these things begin to happen, then the thought is that an organization can not only be profitable or productive, but they can do both at the same time. So they can be productive, and when an organization is productive, then theoretically they are profitable as well, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, so that's sort of the, the logic behind the discussion here for us. So make sense? Are we good so far? Yep, okay because we have a lot more slides to go, so I hope we're okay right now. So when we have this discussion with real estate folks, uh, facility leaders, they generally will tell us, and I actually think that this number is quite low, 62% of real estate and facility leaders will say that they want to make decisions based on this sort of quantitative data. Well, goodness gracious, I hope that they do. You know, what else are they basing this on? Whatever sort of Bob or Kathy thinks we should do. Uh, so it's nice to be able to understand that people are now wanting to use, and I'm sure that they have for a good while, hopefully, real numbers and sort of making the decision. So understand that in a room full of folks that are kind of on board with this already, other people around you tend to be supportive of this as well. And again, I think that this number is low, so it's, it's growing in my opinion. Um, for today, for today and, and all days, I think that it's important to have some assumptions about the workspace, uh, about the physical place, the environment where people go to on a regular basis. And if we can't get past these assumptions with either folks at our organization or if you're an A&D professional, the clients that you engage with, then it makes the, the further discussion quite challenging for us. So these are just some of the assumptions that I think are important. The workplace is a strategic tool. If, if folks don't believe that, then that's quite concerning, right? It's hard for us to get to the next step in the process if they don't believe that the workplace is a strategic tool. The other part of the conversation is that work tends to impact many parts of, a, of an individual and an organization's well-being. There's a great book, I think I should be over here so that you guys can see. There's a great book by Tom Rath called Well-Being, and each of the sections of that book go through these particular topics, career, social, physical, community, and how work impacts these particular things. It's not a Herman Miller book. I love it very much, though, so I talk about it. Uh, Tom Rath also has a very good book called Vital Friends, which I may mention again as we go through the presentation. But this is sort of what we're seeing in terms of the physical space, the people that work in the environment, and those connections. So when we have difficulty or challenges from colleagues, uh, sort of non-believers, if you will, I think that offering them this book is kind of a nice nice conversation. So well-being, I think, is good. The other thing that we want to think about is no neutral. So the space is where people go is either great, it enlivens people, it enriches them, they're jazzed about coming to work every day, or it's not. It is the exact opposite. And we've all been in those environments. Now, I'm sure none of you work in those bad sort of places, but you may have at one particular time, and then you moved on to another location. But the idea here is that there is a no neutral discussion. It's either wonderful, vibrant, creative, flourishing, productive, happy, significant, or it is the opposite. And that's the, the part that I think begins to resonate with many people because they may be working in the environment that is the opposite of those things that I sort of mentioned. Uh, the other thing we find is that people will generally opt out of a poor environment, something that they are not thrilled to be with and will sh uh, be in. And we'll see through the data, I'm not necessarily saying that people are going to uh, go to another organization to work, although sometimes they do. Uh, and I'm not ac necessarily saying that they'll just start working from home or that they'll go to Starbucks or I think there are Tim Hortons here also. Uh, so I'm not saying that they're going to do that. I am saying that they will generally find a space within the landscape that they can do the work that they need to do. And that's just what we've seen through both quantitative and qualitative uh, research in this discussion. So good so far? Yep. Yeah? Okay. 
So those are the assumptions for us. In terms of the path, our journey for today, we'll look at it in these sort of three areas. The impact of well-being, right, uh, for, the, for uh, individuals overall. The connection to real estate, which is all about the performance of, of the space itself, what it's doing to support that worker and, and moving to a place of prosperity for them. And then the connection of engagement. Personally, uh, so I'm sharing both primary research from Herman Miller, secondary research from myself. My, my own sort of passion is around the, the uh, linkage between engagement and the workplace. So I'm going to share some of my uh, my secondary research on that with you today. Uh, so I like it, so I'm going to talk about it. But the idea about engagement and that connection, I think, begins to, to flourish. And, and, and this is my presentation, so I'm going to talk about engagement. Uh, because I think that it, there's a great amount of connection for it. I promise it's, it's important in terms of where we're going for today. Um, so the other half of this, in terms of why data matters, is sort of the scary part of things. Um, I, I teach in, in Dallas and at uh, Texas Wesleyan University in the business school. I teach consumer behavior and retailing and international marketing and all those other sort of courses. Um, and one of the things that we do in case study work with, with our students is a focus around what's called VUCA analysis. So if you've been in the military before, uh, if, you've, if you've served, uh, this, this came from uh, at the end of the, the Cold War, a military term, VUCA analysis. Uh, we've stolen it from uh, business academic world and are using this in, in our teaching settings now uh, to help students understand what's going on in the real world um, right now for many clients and sort of the, the situations that happen with them. So I like it, so I'm sharing this too. The idea with VUCA, it's just an acronym, is that there's a great amount, as you can see, the, the acronym sort of stands for these sorts of things. So VUCA analysis is the understanding that there's a great amount of volatility that happens within a marketplace. We all know that and sort of what's happening right now in terms of the business world, uh, government influences, all of those sorts of things. There's a great amount of uncertainty in terms of what's happening for uh, many organizations, right, in terms of what's keeping them up at night. That's the uncertainty for for them. Uh, I think that this is very helpful also for A&D folks in terms of connecting with clients and having this discussion based on business drivers. Uh, the complexity of the work, so many of our clients will talk to us about the, the great complexity of the daily work that they're doing and how it takes many people to move a process forward. Okay. The last part of this is how things might be a bit ambiguous for them, right? So if you just take Affordable Health Care Act and sort of everything that sort of changes on a monthly or weekly basis about what's happening with it, that's just one situation out of hundreds that an organization might be faced with. But the idea for us in terms of uh, an academic approach is that we don't necessarily want to stay in this crazy, unsettling sort of world, this, this VUCA world. And we want to move to what we call VUCA prime. Not a Herman Miller term, but I like it, so I, I talk about it. Um, it's this idea of moving from things that are volatile to an aspect of providing vision for um, an organization. And this is what we do in case study analysis. From moving to an aspect of uncertainty to a greater sense of understanding, helping an organization understand what their, what their drivers are and how to meet those drivers. So you need a good amount of clarity, which is the third one, in, in the discussion. So as things become clearer in terms of a path for an organization, hopefully the goal is that they can be more agile, nimble. And it's really what we find as individuals, right? We all have to be very agile to move on to do the next sort of thing in our life. And if we can move from this state of ambiguity to be agile as an organization or as individuals, the idea is that good things for, can happen. So in a case study discussion, we want to point out for folks what are the things that are unsettling or horrific, you know, quite challenging, but then eventually not stay in this area here, but move to a path of a VUCA prime, okay? So getting to a better place is, is what we want to do. So that's why these things matter. Data helps create a greater sense of vision, a greater sense of understanding. It makes the pathway clearer for us, and then we can be nimble in our approach or agile in that discussion.
So these are just some of those things. You have economic issues, you have global issues that are going on, you have, you know, war and all of that sort of happen from a global standpoint and I make, you know, not to make light of all of that, but there's lots of things that are happening. We see what's happening in Ukraine, um, how that impacts, so I was in Seattle, that impacts Boeing because there's a location there in Russia and so now they're not able to provide as many services and all of these sorts of things that are happening on, a, on an hourly basis. So with all of this complexity and we may not understand and how that relates to tables and chairs, but there's a whole great range of things that are happening to our customers, if you're in the A&D community, to your clients, and so we need to be able to understand the great challenges that are happening for many organizations right now and be able to support them based on those changing needs, based on being able to support their business drivers. So that's the approach and sort of this understanding here. So thoughts, comments in terms of why data sort of matters before we get into the trends. Anything, anything at all around this? Are you finding it easy to make that case for, uh, let's say if, you're, if you are the customer and, and you have colleagues, I generally find there's someone at the organization that believes this and then they try and get other people sort of on board with this. Do you feel like that's the case or, or yes ma'am? This is something that um, we're working with strongly Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'm struggling to get my superiors on board with is they get the ideas and the concept and the data, right. but what they don't see, you know, and I think I could probably say this just go, for the government as a whole, is Certainly. dollars. So in the case that, you know, we talk about increasing efficiency, uh -huh. recruitment retention is a huge thing, right. obviously, and, uh, you know, making the workplace more, you know, the benefits of making the a better environment to be in. Mm -hmm. You know, to have some hard numbers saying, you know, some case studies saying, you know, at this workplace we did this and they were able to cut savings by X amount of percent after okay. their, their initial investment cost them this much, their saving, overall savings was this percent, mm -hmm. the recruitment retention was this percent, Good. you know, the just some just hard savings costs with dollars and cents to be new. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So you know who your APG person is, yes? Okay, good, okay. So Heather will provide you. So we have, uh, there are at least four case studies that I can think of where we've done post work. And I will show you some of the dollar numbers with real clients in the, so I'm sorry. So, um, one of the things is we have folks uh, looking in other, uh, watching the presentation in other locations. So I, I'm supposed to sort of narrate again or uh, what the question was, and this was around using real data, uh, using numbers to, to quantify the savings from a dollar standpoint in this. Is that, is that okay? Uh, so yes, yes, check mark to that, and I feel like we can do maybe four or five check marks to that based on uh, real organizations. And I've shared that actually not with Air Force but with NAVAC um, in San Diego about, about that. And a little bit at the GSA conference, although military was, um, the branches were not there at the, at the conference that I did. Uh, and that was just Region 9. So um, anyway, yes, we can certainly do that. And I'll show you what some of those dollar amounts look like uh, for some of the clients, okay? Anything else? Anything else? Okay? Okay. So I will be checking up, making sure everybody's okay. So one of the things I want to share with you now, which is also publishable, so your APG person can give this to you if you're interested. Uh, this was a study of 780 something uh, facility managers and A&D professionals. And the facility managers are people that are on the client site. Uh, the A&D folks that were surveyed are A&D professionals that support a client. So they're part of an A&D firm, okay? There was a global study, which we're happy to provide you. I'm focused right now just on the U.S. results for you. So I'm, it was a, sort of a, a four-page document with lots and lots of data. I'm not going to go through all of that with you. If you are interested in it, just make note of it, and, and your APG person or, um, or Mark uh, or somebody uh, can provide that to you. Uh, I'm just going to highlight things from the, the survey that I think are very, very important for us today in our conversation. And I've, and I've circled them here for you. So, and my apologies if, if we can't 
can't see this from the back here, so I'll sort of read this. The findings, FM stands for facility managers. This also includes real estate professionals. And Andy is, is of course, your architecture and design individuals, OK? So what we found uh, in terms of the top drivers for the space uh, for FM, facility managers, and A&D people, these were the top three. And out of these top three, really, it's not six different things. It tends to be four were quite compelling for both sides of the house. Uh, for facilities managers, their top drivers were based on growth, cost effectiveness, and continuous improvement or efficiency, their words, not ours. Uh, from the A&D standpoint, they believed in those same things, but then also added attraction and retention. That was another sort of driver for them. So if you think about what are the hot button drivers for an organization, I would look at it as these particular four. So um, either we can agree with that if we're, if we're um, customers, uh, or if there are other things that begin to resonate. But these tend to be those top four issues. So growth, cost effectiveness, um, continuous improvement, and then, of course, attraction and retention, which I find attraction and retention quite compelling. Yes, sir? How do you define cost effectiveness? Is that in our cost or facility cost? Facilities cost. Facilities cost. Not, not as much labor, but because these are uh, facility and real estate folks, it's based around the drivers of the physical space. So is it density, uh, sort of utilization that drives that? I mean, more people, are more productive is in, in the real estate, uh, yes. And what, we, what, what was also found from this is that many organizations are moving into these smaller locations, but they also have a challenge with growth. And so how do you sort of meet the two as you're moving into a smaller space, but then sort of meet the needs of a growth situation as their top issue for them. Good. Uh, so the, the question was how is uh, how are the numbers around continuous improvement or cost effectiveness, I'm sorry, how is that based on and it's based on the real estate conversation. Okay. Um, not necessarily for the, the cost of employee. Uh, now, the other thing that I find quite interesting from this uh, particular portion of the research document is that facility managers and A&D folks agreed on the most important office design considerations, but A&D felt more strongly about them. So they both are in support of the idea of design considerations that reflect collaboration and new forms of group work. Collaboration and new forms of group work and attraction of top talent. But what we find throughout the study is that A&D people uh, are much farther along in the process. Now, as an IFMA member, I feel I can say this. Uh, in facilities, we are generally focused on what just happened five minutes ago, right? The, the HVAC system went out. You know, there's a leak somewhere. You know, something's going on. And so we're having to deal with what just happened. Is that a fair assessment from facility people in the room or real estate people? So we're always dealing with what just happened. Whereas the design folks, the A&D people, are focused on what's happening next, right? So when we see these numbers, it may not be as compelling for, for facility manager or real estate people, but just understand the idea of where I believe individuals are coming from in the discussion, right? There's, there's a pipe that broke, and so we have to figure out what to do about that. So, so that's sort of what, what we're thinking about. Uh, one of the things that I also found quite interesting in the research is that facility managers and A&D professionals professionals have different projections on the percentage of space dedicated to support collaboration three years from now. So A&D people feel like it's quite compelling, whereas facility managers think that they're honestly, 40, the majority of them think that there won't be any change whatsoever in collaboration. So I'll show you our data is totally opposite that in terms of where collab what's happening in terms of collaboration. but. In building this case, I'm just sort of showing you where you may see resistance in your, in your discussions. Uh, people that are critically on board with this conversation are HR professionals. So if you can get someone in HR to have a discussion about the space, I say bring them to every meeting because they totally know all of this. They are on board with this and they want everybody to sort of hear this and nobody is listening because they think that they're the only, you know, their only goal is to focus on that individual. But, but they're really concerned about the connection of space, which I have another slide that I can talk to as well. So I'm just showing this so that we understand the concerns that that your colleagues may be faced with and how to have that conversation with them, okay? 
and, and then you want to bring someone from A&D with you in the room because, you know, they're already on board with all of this, right? So the other thing that I wanted to mention here, two points. One is around employee engagement, again, because that's what I like talking about, uh, and how this is addressed. So these tend to be the top five issues in terms of how employee engagement is addressed in the physical space. So I want to point out the top two issues. Um, A&D and facility managers both believe that creating a sense of community and belonging is important. That's why that book, Wellbeing, by Tom Rath, I think is critical for us to sort of understand. Because it's based, I mean, that, that idea of community and belonging is essential to Rath's work. Uh, the other part here, helping people understand strategy, culture, and brand, I, I love that. That's sort of my background. So I, I'm very jazzed and pumped up about this particular area. But the idea here is that another advocate in having this conversation around the space could be marketing leaders because the marketing uh, professionals at the organization are very much on board with the idea of brand and strategy uh, and developing that sort of um, idea. So so I would say, in my opinion, and then culture is are your HR people. So in terms of advocates, if we're looking for advocates at, at the at the customer site, I think that those uh, marketing professionals and HR professionals are people that we may not visit with quite often, but I would say they're people that we should. Thoughts, comments, agreements, disagreement, malarkey, anything about that? No? Okay. So the other point that I just want to make from this particular slide here is the idea of generations in the workforce. Uh, there's arguments that go back and forth and whether or not we're supporting uh, generations of, of workers and, and what that sort of means. Um, both your facility managers and your A&D professionals believe that there are considerations that are given to generational workers and, and these are the types of things that they're talking about. The ability to work from anywhere, the type of amenities that are provided. You can see you have 45% of agreement with facility managers but 69% of agreement with A&D professionals. Uh, ideas of open plan, lots of access to software and technology. So those are the types of things that we see that generally support these generations of, of folks in the workplace. So just be aware if if we're having challenges at, at our client site that other organizations find it compelling and are supporting uh, various generations in the workforce. So that begins to build your case. Uh, one of the other things that I think is quite interesting in terms of virtual collaboration or technology here is that, thir and this is for facility managers only were asked this particular question, 31% provide both cloud storage and social networks. So this whole idea of social networks not being integrated into the workplace is, is not I mean, for, of course, for the majority, it may not be happening, but it is on the rise. Uh, so this is the idea of 31 percent. So when we when we talk about uh, security in terms of technology um, and how many organizations may may feel very uncomfortable about either cloud-based storage, cloud-based storage is just a fancy word for a server. We know that, right? Uh, the other thing is the idea of social networks. We find many organizations are moving to this, so it's now almost at a third are supporting this technology. So I just wanted to show that. The other part here that I think is quite interesting are mobile app technology that's being provided by clients at 19%. So the, the thought process here that, that organizations may not be moving fast enough on board to provide mobile technology, mobile app support, it's happening. The train is moving and either organizations are, are going to support it or they're not going to be a part of the what's happening in the future. So I, I show this just to, to kind of concern ourselves in where we are if we're the customer uh, and understand where other organizations are going. So it's happening and, and I think that it's quite compelling for us. Okay. So that's it in terms of the, the data around facility managers and A&D professionals. This next part, before we get into the data of space utilization, is around future thinking, the future of work based on 2018. Any comments or questions so far while we're at this sort of break? Yes, sir. Regarding the data and the use of the data, you know, one of the things that I, I guess is an issue for many people in the government comment is mm -hmm. Change management uh, from the leadership team. So it's one yes, thing sir. that we're all working at the Kool Aid, 
uh, if you will, about the effect of this. But at the end of the day, probably every organization, there's some stodgy number crunching. To the stodgy number crunchers, right, in the room. No disrespect to them, right? Right. You know, and then how do you how do you uh, apply this in a, in a methodology uh, from a change management standpoint to convince executive leadership right. uh, that these are wise investments? Because candidly, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical sometimes of the data that comes out of these because it's right. diluted by all the other improvements that you're trying to make. So right. how do you hang your hat on? I gave a better chair in office configuration to an individual, therefore I got an extra three percent productivity out mm-hmm. versus. Mm-hmm. I also implemented a new system and gave a new computer. Right. You know, or whatever the case may be, uh, they did that. So those are the kind of skeptical questions you get from leadership to say, yes. hey, I want to spend $4 million recuperating in a particular area or whatever the case may be. Right. So I'd like to understand how the data supports convincing that audience. Right. Uh, the people that are already heard Okay, so Robert's question around the process of change management and supporting uh, utilizing data so that we can get stodgy folks on board with, with the discussion. So I hope that Robert will stick with us through the rest of the presentation because the latter half is all about that uh, in terms of the change management process. Um, I get that on, a, on an hourly basis, quite honestly. Um, I'm, I'm typically around stodgy people in a room. Um, and so, so the idea, because one person, one advocate has invited me to be in a room of stodgy people um, and uh, this generally happens so in you know based out of, out of Dallas I have lots of oil and gas sort of experience uh, where folks are, are not wanting to even have this discussion um, and it's it's the idea of kind of changing hearts and minds in all of this um, and, and understanding the harvesting and reinvesting so when we get into seeing those numbers you'll then be able to say okay well I have X millions of dollars what could I do with that as an organization? And again, I'm not saying that they need to buy more tables and shares. I'm saying that they need to do something that's built on a compelling case for their business drivers. So once we show them the numbers, uh, and and you, uh, specifically Robert, then I think that we can kind of have that conversation as well. So if it's okay, I kind of I'll, I'll kind of walk through that with you um, in this process. Okay. But in this methodology, for me, um, in this discussion, I always have to start with, when I have this discussion with the numbers. And I don't go as in-depth as I just did with you here, um, but I have to start with real numbers to make that case. So I, I typically don't go into this discussion with them either, but I'm giving you background, right? Because I want to kind of give you a behind the scenes of building that case. We'll get to all of the bullets, the ammunition, in a second. But um, we'll continue with that building the case. All right, anything else? Any other questions? Yep, good? OK. So there is another piece of work that is a whole other presentation. Um, this is not for every client at all, at all, at all. These are for clients or A&D firms that are very focused on the future. Um, if, if you have sort of a transactional approach, uh, this is not for that particular customer at, at all. Uh, if they are very focused on their vision, so very, you have a, you know, a select group of, of organizations that are, are interested in this sort of, of work. Um, this is our research, which is based on uh, the concept from Peter Schwartz. Uh, Peter Schwartz worked at, I'll start with this one. Peter Schwartz worked for Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, he was their future sort of futurist strategist. He wrote a very good book, although it's very dry, it's on my bedside table, called The Art of the Long View. So if you are interested in it, it's, it's good, but it's dry, so just be ready for that. There are no pictures in it or anything like that. Uh, but the idea is how you plan for the future. And so he goes through the process of scenario planning, which some of your organizations may have done already. Um, others may not or, or be unfamiliar with this process, and that's okay. Um, we at Herman Miller believe in scenario planning so much that this is our third go-round at it since, uh, since 2000. So what, what you do is you start with a question, and then you build scenarios that could take place. 
Now, not all of them are rosy, sort of peachy situations, right? You want to be aware of, the, from the VUCA sort of work, the things that are, might be unsettling, right? Or, or as a, a dis-ease for many organizations. So you focus on that because you want to be able to build support around it what happens, okay? So that's the idea of scenario planning sort of in a very brief nutshell, which doesn't give it any justice whatsoever. But our, our scenario question that we started off with is how will, oh, and I can't do that, how will work change in 2018, okay? So through a long amount of research of two years and not only our research folks, but also a group of about 50 people from across the globe, academic and uh, business professional folks, all of this sort of stuff. We came up with three different scenarios, which I won't discuss today, but out of that come what, what are called, through Peter Schwartz, uh, propositions. And propositions are likely realities, okay? So stay with me. These are what we consider eight of the likely realities for the future of work in 2018, okay? So put your futurist cap on for a second. And these are sort of very high pie in the sky terms, uh, but it's what we see as happening or what will happen in the future so that we can have a more meaningful conversation with our colleagues, with clients, with a and partners about what the future holds, okay? Now, I'm not just saying that these eight are the only things that are going to happen and nothing else is going to happen. That's not the case. I am just saying that I'm focusing on eight in this discussion and how we kind of go about the talk of propositions and these likely realities of what will happen. So I'm not going to talk about all eight, so whew, to that, right? Goodness gracious. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not going to do a deep dive on this. Again, a whole other presentation, but, I'd, but I, you know, I'm not here all the time, so I'm going to give you as much as I can. So the idea here with this first one is called informed choice. Um, it's the, uh, the hyper idea of uh, beyond sort of Yelp, uh, but the idea that in individuals make choices that are based on their uh, connections, their networks. They can sort of influence uh, news and social interactions that they choose to. And we all have preferences on Facebook or Twitter or whatever social media you use based on news reports that you like and other news organizations that you don't like, right? We all have that. So the idea here is how will this in idea of informed choice be linked to the future of work for people? people. And one of them might be um, one organization that when we planned this out, this can be a whole four-hour process where you plot these propositions out for an organization. They determine which ones might be more or less compelling. Uh, one of the things that we talked about with one organization in terms of informed choice was could they create an app, if they created an open work environment, could they create an app that shows where people are working uh, so the person sort of checks in there and if Beth needs to have have a meeting with Bob. She doesn't have to go through the whole space or, or you know, try and figure out where, where Bob is. She just sort of goes to her app on her phone. Bob's sitting here today. She has a meeting at 10 o'clock with him. And so now she's going over there to that location. So it's this idea of, of using information, using this informed choice in order to help people move along in the process. Um, it is also being able to access information in real time. So we talked about this at, um, um, Mount Sinai in Toronto uh, uh, Hospital about an app that may allow individuals to determine if they're the caregiver, what time someone is finished with their appointment so that they can pick them up as opposed to kind of waiting around in the parking lot or maybe the person that's getting services doesn't, uh, doesn't have the ability to operate a phone to contact that person. So how can this then impact the future of, of, of a working environment for them? And I know this is sort of high higher sort of thinking for many of our clients, uh, for, for many customers, but this is just one of the things that could happen. Another one is this digitally mediated relationships. It's the idea that digitally mediated relationships are the default mechanism. So right now we may communicate with each other based uh, on a conference call, but what happens when we start using Skype and FaceTime more often 
with our clients. So when I had this conversation in San Francisco, the A&D firm said, well, all of my clients are already using FaceTime and Skype. They're already doing it right now. Well, we know that that's not happening everywhere, right? It may be happening in this little tiny area of San Francisco with these one super focused you know, media clients, but it's not happening everywhere. So the idea is what happens when folks are using this method as the default for them on a regular basis. So the example I give is I'm typically, when I'm in Dallas, I work out of the Dallas showroom and I have a colleague, she's not here, so her name is Shelly, and she uh, will, um, there's about 15 of us that work there in the showroom, and uh, Shelly sometimes likes to call her children on FaceTime, and, um, and she turns on the volume, and she also likes to introduce her children to us while we're, so that her children know kind of what she's doing during the day and how she's working, and so she'll kind of walk around with the phone and show her, Dara, here, these are my kids, all that sort of stuff. And that's fine, right? Totally fine, it's okay. But what happens when it's four of us doing that? five of us doing that, eight of us doing that, all 15 of us doing that. And we're not just doing that with our kids, but it's also we have a client and we're needing to meet with them via Skype or FaceTime or whatever sort of uh, video technology they're using. So what happens when you go beyond one person doing this to everybody doing this? So the work environment, what we see is that this is going to happen in some form or fashion. So what happens, how does the space then begin to create an environment where people are using video technology quite freely and regularly as someone might just pick up the telephone or use their cell phone, okay? So think about how often you might use your desk phone or your cell phone, then think about that and everybody using video technology and how that might change the, the spaces in which we work. So I don't know the answer to that. I'm just saying this is what could happen, okay? And so we have a discussion about what you could do in the space to have that uh, conversation. Another one is around swarm-focused work. Um, I'll leave it at three, and then we'll, we'll move on. So swarm-focused work is this idea that um, you, so true fact, one-third, one-third of all workers are, in the U.S. are working in a contract or part-time role. Does anyone know someone that's doing contract or part-time work at all? Generally, it's lots of hands that go up, okay? So a third of all U.S. folks are doing that. And, and for someone that also teaches, aside from being at Herman Miller, you know, I do that as well. Um, so the thought about swarm-focused work is that individuals are working in many different swarms at one time. Sometimes that's based on uh, necessity, and sometimes that's based on desire. So for me, teaching is a desire. Uh, for others, it may be that they need to have multiple jobs to sustain you know, a living sort of environment for themselves and their family, and so they have to be in multiple swarms. Um, the other thought process in swarm-focused work is individuals that are not uh, linked to an organization, but they're linked to a group of contract folks that move around from location to location. So you think about, others might know this as the Hollywood model of working, where you have a group of people that are focused on set design and makeup and props and all that sort of good stuff and they work on the latest and greatest action film and then when that's done then they move to another area and they work on the latest and greatest western or whatever it might be. So the thought in both of these situations is that individuals are not linked from a cultural standpoint to the main organization. Okay, um, It's different than working in teams. It's the idea that we're moving from place to place and we must be great at the one thing that we do or or else we can be kicked out of the swarm. Does that make sense, right? So if you're good at blue widget making, you must continue to be the best blue widget maker because someone else will take you or, or someone else will take that position. At the same time, there isn't an organization that they are at that is supporting them from a full-time basis bless you, to nurture them, to support them over time to learn new skills, to become more focused, to take on additional roles, responsibilities, to grow them. They're kind of stuck in this portal of contract work movement and as they, as they continue. So the idea is how does that impact the workspace 
when you have people that may be disconnected and you have space where they're just there for a certain amount of time and then need to move on into another location, right? Which for A&D people, you may have some of those folks right now, yes, that are working in sort of a contract and, uh, situation for your customers. Uh, clients may have those situations right now where you have actual customers uh, or, or um, employees that you hire for a project by project basis, okay? Okay, uh, so now we'll get into the data, what, what you came here for. I just wanted to sort of bake this, and now it's ready to take out of the oven, okay? So thoughts, questions, anything? Okay, here we go. All right, since 2008, since 2008, uh, we at Herman Miller have been measuring and monitoring uh, space in terms of seat utilization. There are many, um, do I have that? Yes. There are many different organizations uh, that, that use other ways to, to sort of figure out these numbers. And that's fine, no judgment. I'm just showing you our research in terms of the collection of data, okay? So you know sort of where this is coming from. We have, and I'll get into what this all means in a second. So we have measured, actually we finished ESPN a little while ago, so we're at 25,000 seats. And I have some other ones happening otherwise. So we're, we're well over 25,000 seats right now that we have studied. Um, the average study, so I'm showing you the back research into this, right? The, the average study is around 300. We've done a small study, um, 34, that really doesn't help unless it's a very small firm uh, or organization, to as many as over, I, I believe now the most that we've done is 2,500. I actually did that one in Houston, worked all night and put little moats under chairs. And so I'll talk about what all of that means in a second. So, so this is where the research is coming from. And I want you to understand that it is continuously being refreshed, all right? So this is not old data, it is collected and continues over time. So this is where we're getting at, all right? So what happens is, in terms of how this research was created, there are these little moats, I call them accelerometers, but they're little moats, um, that have a little sticky adhesive Velcro to them, and you place them underneath chairs. Now, it's great if they're Herman Miller chairs, but they don't have to be. Uh, as long as there's some sort of wiggle room, as long as there's some sort of motion, um, we can determine its utilization. Now, we're working in lounge seating as well. We're kind of testing that out right now. It worked in Houston. It's working in Seattle right now. Um, so that's sort of what we're thinking about. But best case scenario is something with wiggle room to it. So things with casters. So conference chairs, uh, private office uh, chairs, uh, the desk chair uh, or side chairs if they have casters on them, workstation seating, those sorts of things, okay? Now, I want to be very clear about this. We are not measuring whether or not Bob or Kathy are being productive at their desk, okay? We cannot determine we cannot determine whether or not Bob or Kathy are on Facebook or reading the latest and greatest spy novel, none of that, okay? We, we, that is not what this is doing. So if you're wanting to find more about productivity in terms of this utilization, we are not that sort of organization, okay? We are not putting RFID tags on people. We're not having, uh, we're not putting up cameras. We're not having individuals punch in codes, none of that sort of stuff. All right. It is very unobtrusive. It's actually a philosophical difference. Um, I personally don't want workers to have to do this. I want them to be focused on their work. Um, so that's sort of where we're coming from. And you may want to get other sorts of data, and that's definitely fine. I'm just showing you sort of where we're coming from in our discussion. All right. So uh, this is what we know, and our goal is to understand the utilization of the seat which links, in our opinion, to the space, okay? So the, the measuring, the utilization of the chair and, and how often that is, is being utilized over time. It happens during a three-week study. One week does not give us good data. Eight weeks is honestly no better than three, okay? And this happens between an 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. time period generally, but it's based on the customer, okay? It's never done during a holiday time. It's never done 
done on the weekend, if the, if the client isn't there on the weekends, it's all only done right during the time when people are actually there doing their work. And during holiday does not give us good results, right? Because people are on vacation. And, and you want it to be built on you know, a good amount of, of facts and reality, of course. So that's what's happening here, okay? In terms of the, the measurement and the monitoring of the, of the space in regards to the seat itself, okay? Yes? All right. So what we are able to provide through our data scientist folks to the client are these, and I know you can't see this, it doesn't matter though, but what you're able to see are, with the client are lots of different pieces of how the data can be sliced and diced based on days, hours, departments, however they want it sort of measured, that's, that's what they're seeing, okay? Providing that background. So this is the point in time when folks are either in disbelief, shock and awe happens, or they're clapping or something, right? There's some sort of emotion either way when we get to this slide um, in the room because I'm always around people, you know, one believer and then everyone else is that, that those other folks that are in disbelief. So here's what, here's what we have found through all of this kind of knowledge, right? Um, 80% of the time, 80% of the time, private offices go unused. 60% okay? of the time, workstations go unused. And 50% of the time, conference rooms go unused. And when they and when they are used, only half the seats are being filled. Okay? So real deal, no joke, data across the board. Organizations then begin to argue, my organization is different. That's fine, and I'm going to get into that in a second. But this is the data overall that we have collected. And again, it's based on the, the utilization of that share within that space. Okay, Not cameras, not RFID tag, not someone typing in. It's not the room monitor situation right? Be or the, the, um, the conference room check-in. Because sometimes you know this, although I'm sure you never have done this, you check out a conference room and then you're not able to use it for whatever reason. So that is not good methodology, in my opinion, just personally, to determine if the space is actually being used. One way to determine that is whether or not people are actually sitting in the chair. Okay. So sometimes I'm going to sort of think about questions that you might ask. Sometimes people will say, how are individuals, how do they respond when you tell them that this is happening, right, that there's a sensor on their chair? Robert, might you ask that question maybe? No? No? Okay. Let's say someone else will ask that. Okay. So the process um, is very transparent. We do not engage with a client that is not going to tell their employees that this study is happening. That's another sort of philosophical sort of thing for, for us, okay? So uh, they have to know, everybody who's using the space who may be potential users of that seat has to know what's going on. And we provide boilerplate communication, all that sort of good stuff in terms of what's happening. So I want to make that very clear. Everybody knows what's happening. And the idea is that we're not measuring, again, someone's productivity. We're measuring the real estate utilization based on the seat, okay? So that's that's what happens. Very transparent process. So, um, so we show these numbers. We understand that it could be different based on various industry, that's fine. Uh, but then we'll sort of get into some thoughts about that and I'll show you this information. So in general, other things that we find is that rooms with technology, conference rooms, meeting rooms with technology are five times more likely to be used than rooms without technology. And in general, through both the quantitative and the qualitative research, qualitative research for us is built on focus groups, surveys, observational ethnography, all that sort of good stuff, uh, we find that people tend to clamor for smaller meeting room spaces, which our A&D friends, you know, you already know this, and I'll give you data to sort of back that up in the conversation, okay? So here is a real client. This is a real client, and I'm providing their real numbers for you today, okay? So um, I won't share who the client is. I'm just sort of telling you this is what it is. I don't want to get caught into the weeds of how they came about with this particular number, uh, the cost of their real estate. This is their own number. We did not determine this. They provided this number based on their real estate, if it's leased or if it's owned, all of that sort of stuff. And they put into this dollar amount whatever they wanted to, to factor this in. All right. So this is their number. 
What we provided was the utilization uh, of their workstations, private offices, and conference rooms. So you can see their utilization average of workstations was 40%. Their private office utilization was at 23%. So I told you it might, you know, the average might fluctuate a bit, and you can see that it did here for them. Um, so you see this information here. Now the client can determine the cost of the util the cost of each space. However, they determine it. Their numbers, not ours. Okay, their numbers. What I want us to look at here are these numbers in red. So what they're sh saying, what this client is saying, is that. If 40% of the seats are being used, let, uh, uh, if the utilization is 40%, 60% of the time their workstation is not being utilized, they equate this to a specific dollar amount that they have put together, their real estate people, okay? And they determine that that cost being underutilized in terms of, this is the harvest part, okay, is $7.79 million. For private offices, 3.95. For conference rooms, 2.2. So 7, 3, 10, 11, 12, 13 million dollars. Here is what this customer, their, the real estate folks for this customer put together that was being under or un, not utilized, okay? So we can argue whether or not these real numbers should be $13 million, $7 million, $2 million. We can have that discussion all day, okay? But the thought is, at what point, at what point in the conversation, how many millions of dollars does it take to make a compelling case to do something about this number? That's the concern for the client, right? In terms of whatever resonates with them. We are not saying at any point in time that you need to give up 60% of that, of that uh, real estate, right? Or 40 or, or 77%. That's, that's not logical, right? You want to understand not just the quantitative data, but the qualitative data. Why are they not using that space? What else are they doing? So we're not saying to harvest all of that, okay? But how much do you want to harvest? And then reinvest it, so from a dollar standpoint, then reinvest it into something else, okay? Based on whatever the critical needs are of your organization. I am not again saying that they need to reinvest that into tables and chairs or even into real estate. It could be something, uh, if they're a product organization, maybe they're going to put this money into R&D or, or a, another service offering that they might be able to provide. The thought process, again, is for them to determine the cost of that utilization, lack of utilization, to help themselves, them, build this compelling case. Does this, does that, are we okay with that? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Do you see much of a variance in terms of utilization by interaction versus service versus interaction? You are on my next slide, Al. You are on my next slide. Good. Okay, so the question was, do we see utilization difference based on industry? And someone always asks that, and so I have that slide. Uh, so I've, I've sort of prepared for the likely realities of questions that might be happening here. So. I'll have another example of another real client with numbers sort of at the end of all of this, but I'm starting again with the end in mind. This is the compelling case, hopefully, um, that, that we're discussing, all right? So uh, this is another real client, and although they have wonderful names for their conference room, like Aspen and Vail and Keystone and Breckenridge, um, they still did not have excellent utilization of their conference rooms. <laughs> so utilization is, uh, for in the Aspen conference room, 3% utilization, Vail 18% utilization, Keystone 25% utilization. And that's even with a good amount of technology in the room, right? So, so even though we say these things five times more likely to be used in the conference room when you have technology, it's not going to be the same for every client. That's certainly fine. Um, but the best result is sort of testing it on your own, testing your own sort of physical space. Okay, to Al's question, and I know government is misspelled, I didn't put this slide together. So, uh, think about this. Uh, in the history of doing our research, all right, uh, what we have found, every organization will say that they're very unique, but at the end of the day, the average number of folks
in a conference room are three to four people. The average number of people that use a conference room are between three and four. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It's three to four. Now, will there be a time when you need to have 15 people in a conference room? Yes, of course. Will there be a time when you may need to have 20? Yes, that's fine. But are we building based on that one time a quarter or are we building on what's happening every hour, right? So that's, this is just data that you can sort of take from this conversation. Uh, you can also see here utilization within industry of conference rooms. So when I had my GSA presentation, I showed them conference room utilization at 40%. Uh, research pharmaceutical um, at uh, 37% uh, space here. Business services also include professional services as well. That's at 60%. You have IT or technology. Their conference room space is at 51%. But if you take a look here, financial services, goodness gracious, 21% utilization of their conference rooms, okay? Just what we've seen with our customers since 2008 it's just that, you know, it's not every single financial services organization in the country, right? Because we haven't measured all of them. It's just sort of showing you what, where we are with the numbers, okay? So just keep sort of that, that in mind. Um, the other thing that I want to show you here is utilization based on vertical market. So services here, uh, these represent your business and professional services. The red bar indicates utilization. The red bar indicates utilization of workstations. The gray bar indicates utilization of private offices. Okay? So here we go. Financial services are the ones that are constantly clamoring. Insurance and financial services are always the ones that are clamoring for their private offices. Always, always, always. We have to have our private offices. Utilization of those private offices, 14%. 14%, okay? Um, another energy is also a favorite of mine, being in my neck of the woods. 23% uh, utilization for private offices, and they love their wood private offices, wood-lined private offices, 23%. Uh, real deal situation, customer energy company in Houston, the, they were uh, the only reason why they were moving out of private offices is because they had an attraction retention, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, they had a knowledge sharing problem. New folks were coming into their space. Veterans would go into their private office immediately and close the door. And so the new folks were not able to kind of get an understanding of how the organization works. Um, and so the only, only, only reason why the organization was moving outside of private offices is because they felt like if they didn't do something in the next five to ten years, there would be no one who knew anything about their organization because all of those folks in the private offices would be retired. Honest story. And, we, and so the case for those folks that were a bit grumpy and hostile was because they weren't going to exist. I mean, that's how they felt. And so they came to us and, and how, had this conversation because of the knowledge sharing sort of issue in this. So these are just sort of the uh, discussion around manufacturing. You can see private office utilization, 16%. Workstation utilization at 36%. So this is just some of that information. I have some information built on law firms. Uh, some of our, of our research is at, in different industry is not uh, statistically relevant, meaning I don't have enough data. Um, I, I have a couple of thousand seats in Canada, but I can't make a reference in terms of, you know, in Canada, how often are people utilizing their space or not. So that's just one example. But we can show you from what this looks like in terms of utilization. Okay, now many times, many times, yes ma'am, sorry, go ahead, no ma'am, no, fine, certainly. Have you done research in Europe and how does that uh, juxtaposition to the U.S.? Europe, uh, the question was around utilization in, in Europe. We've done uh, space, I actually have um, an something that is about to happen in London with 800 seats. The most, the bulk of our study is in North America, the bulk being, of course, in the US. We have sample work in Europe and in India. At this point, I don't feel like it's statistically relevant to share as fact. I can just share it as insight, which would be in sort of a, a discussion um, about all of that. Uh, so I can do that at another time for you to provide through your, uh, oh, you're here. Yes. They are, um, but I don't provide it as a, as a fact yet because I don't have enough stuff on it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What about regional within So this is, this is what generally also happens. Um, we'll, we'll 
ask about regional influences. It is less compelling. That data is more compelling built on their industry. Many times the argument, folks that are not yet on board, um, will, and this, this actually was a true story. Uh, grocery stores chains family owned in the north northeast section of the country. That's what the, that's what they wanted, right? So the, so at this point in time, it was no longer an argument about reality. It was just sort of find someone exactly like us and see what they do. Well, th we need to base this data based on our own sort of work, not necessarily you know the next door neighbor or what's happening here. So what we found is that it's really the industry less about the region that's more compelling in terms of what's happening, okay? So, um, so the next part of the conversation um, is around, any other questions? Anything else? Okay, the next part of the conversation is many times people are in great disbelief in terms of how often they utilize their space. And so these are five real clients and we've asked them, the gray bar indicates how often they told us through survey work they use their space. I like picking on client number two. They tell us that they use their space 86% utilization. That's high, that is very high, quite honestly. 86% utilization. So this is not my goal. 70%, it's just a goal to think about. And a real estate uh, person should think about, of course, what their real estate um, optimum is in terms of utilization. Okay, so let's just say it's 70%. 100% is not, not appropriate. Yes? I understand that you can go since 2008, but when you go to a certain business, when you put them up there, you know, is that over the range of one year or, or what kind of timeline? These specifically that I'm showing are based off of the last two years. So our early work, and I'm refreshing this sort of constantly in the discussion. Um, and these are across industry. So this particular slide is not reflective of only the tech industry. The point of this slide is to help us under, oh, I'm sorry, the question was around um, how fresh is the, it, the data and is there, is this a particular? Right. But when you when you flash up there site one, two, three, right. are you there for six months or are you there for a year or because I know trends change mm -hmm. within an industry. Right. Um, so they may be very busy and then they may not be very busy. Right. And they may be very busy again. So I was just wondering what the time frame was for for this. Okay, so the the question was in regards to the the time frame and the folk and the fact that some industry may be more or less busy during certain times of the of the year or what's happening for them as an organization. I think so. First, it's this this information is based off of the last two years. It, these do not reflect organizations that we are monitoring. It reflects organizations that we have measured. So that the the three week study, but not consistent consistently going in the, uh, every six months or something of that sort. The, the idea behind this slide is to create a thought process that individuals are, are less aware of how often they're actually using their space and that their numbers, if asked, you know, if you were to do another version of this is just to ask them how often they use their space, they may not be as aware or there, or there may be other factors in this. I don't want to so I'm going to say that I'm using it, you know, 75, 80% of the time, whatever it might be. So I bring up this slide to simply show that when you ask them, those numbers might be different. So the red line to your, to your response or to your question, the red line indicates the utilization based off of our three-week study of, what's, of what has, has happened. And only during a time when they're actually working and not during a holiday time and all that sort of good stuff. Okay. So for that example, for site two, they felt like they used their space 86% of the time. In actuality, they only used their, their utilization was only at 23% of the time. Okay. So the thought process here, again, is for us to be able to think about how, uh, how important factual data is as opposed to sort of this idea of, of what, what people think, right, based on just sort of their feeling about an idea. So numbers matter in the discussion. Al.
Right. Right. So the other, so uh, based on the question based on this data, sort of what do you do with this when there's such a, a large differentiation? So what's important to do is match the quantitative data with qualitative data around uh, focus groups and, and additional survey work in post to find out what the disconnect is. So you need both types of data to build that conversation, but you need to start at zero, in my opinion, which is, which is the numbers discussion. Okay, um, then the other uh, challenge that we face with some clients uh, are folks that will tell us that they walk around and do uh, what we call bed checks uh, to see if people are, they've done their own study and they say, well, we've walked around to see uh, what the utilization is. And we call those bed checks. Uh, one, one client actually has something they call signs of life. So if signs of life, so if someone left their cardigan here, or if there was a cup there, or trash in the trash can, those were the three signs of life, okay? A, a cardigan or a jacket, uh, trash in the trash can, or a cup, or some, some cup, hot, hot cup or coffee mug or something on the desk. If those three things were present, they checked that that space was being utilized. Now, that doesn't necessarily help us because we don't know how long that they're going to be outside of that particular space. And our goal is to, again, focus on that real estate and to maybe use those dollars in another different way. So uh, these are, again, four different clients. They did their bed check work, which is highlighted in red. And then we went in and did our uh, accelerometers or moats and determined what their utilization was. So you can always see that the bed checks consistently will be higher than actuality of the seat utilization. And that is based on many different things. The signs of life um, from one particular customer. Um, many times it's based on that thought process that I don't want Carol to lose her desk and so I'm going to mark that Carol was here. And really it's you know not about any of that. It's, it's really just looking at the real estate of the space. So this is just one thing to sort of keep in mind in that discussion. Now, the idea that we want to get to is at least a conversation around the possibility of shared space. Because we know that 60% of the time, workstations are going unused. So can we at least have a minor, minor discussion about shared seating in the conversation? So someone then will raise their hand at this is what happened at my Collier's conference, and say, what happens if I come to work and there isn't a place for me to sit after we've had this shared space sort of discussion, right? That all, someone always asks that question. So in the history of doing this sort of research work since 2008, the history of doing this work, that has never, ever, 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 ever happened where all seats were being filled during a study, okay? So this is, these, this is another real client. I'm going to show you two just as an example. This is not always the case, but I'm just showing you the percentage of what's happened with this, these two real clients. Uh, this was a study of 375 seats, and you can see here there were always at least, at least, ladies and gentlemen, this is quite concerning, at least 203 seats or 54% of the seats were empty during the entire three-week study. Not just a day, but during the entire three-week study. This should be a compelling case to do something different within the space. And the possibility of just considering a shared sort of work environment in some way or capacity um, in this discussion. Another client, we measured 161 seats. For them, during the study, at least, at least 33% of the seats were not used throughout the study, okay? Now, I understand it can be different based on industry and time of year and all of those sorts of factors, okay? You can factor in lots of different things in the conversation, but at what point in the case, do you want to make a decision based on this snapshot of information to be able to move forth with this? Again, I'm not saying that you take out 33% of the seats or 54% of the seats, but you could, you could do away with some of these and have a different sort of framework for the workplace. Now, we're not getting into how those can be designed. That's all for your great dealer designer folks to sort of put together, but wouldn't it be great 
great to give your dealer designer partners in the back over there? Uh, wouldn't it be great to give them real information to do something with? I think that that would be wonderful to be able to give them based on, based on this data, here's what we can do for you from what we know, okay? So that's sort of my soapbox. Questions, anything so far? Yes, ma'am, and then we'll go over here. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Do you, for that three-week period, tell them, use your chair, don't stand up? Okay, very good question, uh, and, I, and I get this one too, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, try and answer that already. So because this, the seat is being measured, in a standing situation, we would not be able to measure their utilization. So one idea would be for them to sit during that time period. Another part of it would be the, the acknowledgement that we need two sets of data, the quantitative information, but then also the qualitative information. So we can go back and through focus groups and surveys ask what type of work they are doing and that's when they can tell us you know X percentage said that they do stand up X percentage of the time because we we want to base that built on you know the real work that they're doing so it may not necessarily be that they need to sit down for that three week time period but you do have to follow it up with additional information right numbers are just one component if you want to build the biggest case you need two sets of the piece is that okay in terms yeah okay yes ma'am that's all right okay so you can do it one of two ways I like it Either one is fine, based on the organization, sort of what they need. All right, so this is a real client. This is not an industry average based on departments. So I want to make that very, very clear. This is just a, this is a real client, a real snapshot, not an industry average. Many times a client will want to find out what the utilization is within particular departments, okay? I'm, this is my argument I'm building towards shared spaces, okay, or shared work areas. All right, so here's what happens. These are things that everybody in the room already knows it's just important to have real data to back these numbers up so for this one real real client okay they found out that in their sales recruitment and leadership area and marketing folks were not generally using their seats very often they had a lower all we need to understand here is that the red bars indicate lower utilization darker gray bars indicate heavier utilization okay I don't, we don't need to get into the percentages. Just understand, dark bars, heavy users, red bars, lower users. So what we found here is that human resources, finance, and customer support were for this client, not all clients and all with all of these departments, but just this one client, human resources, finance, and customer support were heavy users of their space, okay? So the argument here is that this is against the cookie cutter model, right, of, your, of the design programming, right? It is the thought process that not everyone should have the same space. That's okay. Um, it's quite challenging for many people to kind of get on board with that, but this is the case that makes this, okay? So in this one customer example, the space, the physical place for these three departments, sales recruitment and leadership, we would argue should look very very, very, very different from the space utilized by human resources, finance, and customer support. Yes? Does that make sense? Okay. This is quite important for a client. This makes the case against the matrix that organization, every sort of cube must be this size. This is the reasoning behind it because human, uh, human resources, finance, and customer support really need different type of space because they're using it more often than these other individuals. So I would argue that maybe if your sales team has 12 people, that could you possibly deal with eight chairs or nine chairs, nine spaces for people to do work? Because no 12 are ever going to be there at the same time. And then they can just go in a conference room or something if you do have 12 seats there. So the thought process is that can we then harvest the real estate and then do something else different with it based on the way that people are actually working. So if you remember that slide two where we were focused on the way that people are really doing work, not the way that we want to fit them in a little box, this is the way that people are really working. Okay. So again, I want to point out again, 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 this is not how every sales 
uh, department is. This is not how every human resources department is, every finance, every customer support. This is just one, one client, okay? Yes, ma'am. This was done by chair. Everything, everything the utilization is uh, in this research is done by the chair study, okay? All right. So what we can also find is by location what's happening. This is another real client, and you can see here less utilization is indicated in red, heavy utilization is indicated in these darker gray blocks here. So the idea is that the person sitting in this area, this private office, this private office, this private office, it is an argument against I need, I have to have my private office. Could we possibly consider maybe a shared space for some of these red users? And for these gray users, well, they utilize their space quite often, okay? Now, we're not always going to be able to do this, create a shared space for these people that aren't utilizing their private offices, but this at least gives us real numbers, right? So they may say, well, I need to have my private meeting, you know, from time to time. Well, how often is that happening? Well, you know, once every two weeks or once every month or whatever it is, right? Yes, Robert. Was there any uh, behavioral analysis uh, done based on the people you were studying? So, you know, think of Myers Briggs, risk assessment, and things. Mm -hmm. My personal experience is you got sort of the Chad Cathy types that mm -hmm. are more active, collaborative, and then you had the more introverted types right. who, which would affect your scoring largely based on the individual, not the work. Uh, was that back then? Well, no, no, it wasn't. But I would, I would argue that. People that need to get up and get something done, what we have found will get up and do that 80% of the time in private offices, 60% of the time in a workstation. So um, this tends to be less about introvert, extrovert, and more about the compelling work that they have to do to sort of get their work done, is, is my argument. And we can certainly disagree with, with that. The, the, the idea here is that we want to focus again on, on that real estate and we can go back and do a qualitative discussion around focus groups where we can get more of that understanding of individuals and, and the work that, that they're wanting to do. It's not a perfect science, but it's important to sort of base it on some, some sort of discussion. And, and so this is beginning to have that conversation, if you will. So one of the other things that we're able to see, oh, this is my only one. So the idea is, again, this is not always going to happen. You know, we're not always going to be able to get to a shared space, but this begins to build that compelling case, okay? So part of this is, uh, again, a continuation of the data that we're able to provide to the client in terms of what's happening. But what you do with all of this is to hopefully lay the groundwork to have a discussion with your dealer designer partners, okay? So using these bits of information, can you then be able to go into programming to calculate those space needs and build a strategy based on those real numbers. And I would argue that we need to build a space based on their business drivers, not necessarily a person, I would argue, just Jesse, that it should be built on the, the, the work that needs to be done based on the organization's drivers and not the personality types of individuals. I'm an extreme introvert, but as you can tell, I have to sort of deal with that uh, from time to time. And I think many other folks sort of have to deal with the work that they have to get to, to get done, to be, uh, to be finished in the process. So I think that it's important to build that work strategy off of the metrics based on the organizational goals. So one of the things that you can also find out through the data of space utilization are whether or not you have, in general, groups of people that are heavy users or, or um, not heavy users of the space. And so what this is again a real client example, not an industry average, none of that. It's just one snapshot of one client. When we did our study, we were able to find out that the bulk, and this is not always the case, right? But the bulk of these, only 7% were resident workers, but the bulk were either in mobile or flex, uh, we would consider. And those terms, someone might ask, well, how do you come about those terms of mobile flex resident? Well, that's what it's based on here. So the utilization of 61 to 100%, we would consider a resident. Utilization of 31 to 60%, of 10 to 30% is around this flex area, and less than 10% is a mobile worker. So I'm a mobile worker in the Dallas showroom, okay? Um, 
and you can argue those percentages and that's fine, okay? But at the, end of the, at, at the end of the day, the goal is to sort of build a place, a strategy around this discussion. So you have mobile, resident, flex, or however you want to define them is certainly fine, okay? But we want to know how many people in the space are resident, mobile, flex, or whatever you choose for your terms, so that you can then build a space based on that and not everybody needs a, you know, six by six, five by seven workspace, okay? Because not everybody does. If, we're, if we find out that there's only 7% resident workers, this, this makes a, a big case that the space should be very different for many of these other folks here. Okay, so what you do with this, this is my one slide in regards to programming and that's it. Um, so once you find out this information, folks are more resident, mobile, or flex, then you can begin to design with your dealer designer partners what that might look like. So this is an example of what a flex space would be. It has some storage. This back area here, which I know you can't see, is a mobile space. It has no filing and storage here. This is the space that I typically sit in um, at, at, at our, my showroom in Dallas. And then if you're a resident worker, you're typically in this sort of space. And you see here that it has more work surface for you. It has more filing and storage than a place like this or a place like this here on the other side. I know that that's very big sort of idea. It's not very specific in the, in the approach, but it's the thought of building the strategy based on this. Then you need to give that to your A&D professionals, uh, to your dealer designer partner to then use that data to make a great space. Yes? Okay? Yeah? Okay. So this is again another real client, numbers provided by the um, the financial numbers provided by the real client. This is not an industry average or an average over since 2008. This is just one snapshot that I'm showing you. So I started with the dollars at the end of this conversation. I'm starting it with it or ending with it here in this sort of process. So um, for this uh, organization here, you see over 2,100 seats were measured in this study. Um, they determined, they determined, not us, this cost within the square footage, and they determined that their opportunity of underutilized space was at one point uh, $23 million. So for them, their, this thought was that it could fund 498 workstations. Okay, and I don't want to get into the weeds again about all the cost of a workstation and this and that, but I just want to show you how they determined the, the cost would be for them. Now, I'm not necessarily saying if their utilization uh, if their overall utilization was at 14%, maybe they should not be buying 498 workstations, okay? So think about that. But what I am thinking about is uh, what they could do with that $1.23 million, okay? Again, maybe it's in R&D, maybe it's in te technology, whatever it might be, but allowing them to determine what that value is of uh, uh, areas that aren't being utilized and then be able to build a case around those dollars, okay? It's very, 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 very important that the client for us comes up with those real estate numbers, not, not us, but how they want to define it uh, based on their needs. Uh, so then the next part of this is around space syntax. Does anybody, has anyone done space syntax work or aside from design folks? Uh, okay, so um, space syntax has uh, lots of different things about the discussion, but um, was, I, I think there's a, a good article in the Harvard Business Review called Who Moved My Cube, which I'm happy to share with the uh, Herman Miller folks here and the APG people with if you don't have it already, and you can share that with your clients. Um, it basically, in my opinion, goes through the rules of space syntax without saying it's space really is. So it talks about different thoughts space and why space magic matters. And here are the three, and they all start with a P, and so it's very easy to remember. So this is not data, this is sort of research uh, theory sort of stuff. So the first one is built on proximity. We're getting into a new discussion here. So the first one is built on proximity. There's generally a 30 meter rule um, and a, a, a rule of turns within space syntax. So if you have to make four turns, you Heather, Heather, if, if, you, if Heather has to make 
four turns, I know you're not at the same place, but I'm just going to use it as an example. If Heather has to make four turns to see Michael, let's say that they work at the same place, which I know they don't, uh, then Heather will never see Michael. Three turns, she may see Michael, uh, but the idea is four turns, you'll never see somebody else, okay? So um, it's also built, built on this idea of a 30 meter rule. So if your organization is having challenges around collaboration, connection, knowledge sharing, all that sort of good stuff, it's not going to happen if people have to have lots of turns in the space uh, to, to make that discussion happen, okay? So you want to give people as many routes as possible and you want to decrease the amount of turns that they have to take. True story, no joke, all built on research. Four turns, you're never going to see someone. The next thing, the next thing, so you have uh, proximity. The next one is privacy. So there's lots of blogs out there right now that are making um, very nasty comments about the, spa the new space of working and that sort of open plan environment, okay? And it's not working and there's all of this sort of not stuff which you can see out there, okay? So here's my thought to all of that. Privacy matters and, and I would argue that folks at the dealership and Herman Miller will tell you that regularly. We are not saying in terms of drinking the Kool-Aid that everybody needs a, a very high collaborative open space, benches all around. We're not saying that at all, at all, at all. We are saying that the space needs to be built on an organization's drivers and where they are wanting to be five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And I would argue that all of that sort of stuff, that discussion of negativity around these blog postings in um, the open plan environment is because they didn't have good A&D people like those that are in the room here uh, to build a great space for them based on what they actually need and not just do a cookie cutter work based on some other client that you know has no bearing on where they're going. So my argument around the bad space of the open environment is that maybe it, it shouldn't have been that place in the first place, but there wasn't good programming around it. My other argument in regards to that is that there wasn't probably a good change management process. And if you don't have a good change management process, it doesn't matter what's going on, uh, you're going to have that dip in productivity and the time frame is going to be longer. So it's either that they didn't have a good A&D group working with them to do programming or they didn't have a good change management process in place. Those are my arguments against why spaces don't generally work. And it doesn't matter what they are, if they're open plan or if they're all private offices or whatever happens. It's, in my opinion, it's one of those two reasons, okay? So there's my soapbox. Did you have a question? No? You're okay? Any questions about that? I have another P. Yes, ma'am. Dara. It's not going to end well, Dara. It really isn't, right? It's not going to end well, right? So, I, and that's why, and th that's what happens, right? It's somebody is wanting to base it on what Bob wants or what Kathy wants and less on what the organizational business drivers are to build this compelling case. I've said organizational business drivers, I think maybe 15 times. So that is the importance here and less about someone sort of pushing this through. If that happens, you won't have good results, right? If they, right, I'm sorry, they still have, why do they still have jobs? Well, hopefully, well, I can't get into all of that, right? So I can just show you, I can just tell you what I can tell you, right? I'm going to get to the change management piece, though. So stick with me, Dara, please. Um, don't leave, don't leave. All right, so the other part of the space logic, the, the last one is the, the P for permission, okay? So uh, true story, at Herman Miller, uh, we built this beautiful coffee bar plaza area and no one would ever use it. Uh, and the reason why is because they felt like it wasn't okay to use it. So what happened is that our folks had to schedule, schedule spontaneous meetings with the directors and executive leadership folks to use that coffee bar plaza space. And it wasn't until those folks actually used that space, it gave them the P, permission, for other people to then use that space. So my other argument around open places and collaboration, no one ever uses that lounge space or no one ever uses this space, which I know you all do, but let's just say it's at a place where nobody ever uses it. The reason why people don't use it is because they feel like it's not okay, it's not appropriate, no one ever said that they could. So the only way that people will use that space is if their boss or their boss's boss or their boss's boss's boss uses that space as well. And sometimes as strategy people, we have to schedule those unscheduled sort of conversations. Okay, so just 
be ready to, to do that or else people aren't going to use that space. Now once they find out it's okay, they'll use it all the time. And that's what we found through, through our work at, at our office. But it's only going to happen if, if they see leadership doing it. So proximity, privacy, permission. Those are the three sort of basics within this idea of space syntax. Um, this can really get into the weeds, so we're not going to talk about this very much, but I just want to show you the idea here is number of turns. I know you can't read any of this, but you want to maximize the possible routes. So this route here uh, with this particular layout configuration had 189 possible routes with 3.43 average turns. When you reconfigure the space, it ends up with uh, 500 plus uh, possible routes and 2.36 average turns. So all of that sort of links to the idea that you, have, you want to have more ways to get somewhere um, and more possibilities to make that happen and less turns in the process. So any questions for that should be directed to your A&D people and your dealer designer partners in the room in regards to that sort of stuff. But I just wanted to show you why this matters in terms of uh, proximity, if you will. All right. So we talked about all of the quantitative data. It is important, I mentioned a couple of times, to you so much to put this in perspective with your qualitative data and that can be through which some of your A&D firms here may provide these services that's um, that can be around your interviews your focus groups your surveys or your observational ethnography. And observational ethnography is just a fancy word for sort of walking around the, the space and, and observing. Uh, so we do that with photography. I have decibel readers that we kind of walk around and determine the noise level of spaces, all of that sort of work, right? But there are different ways that you can do this in the approach, but you need to have both sides, both quantitative and qualitative data in the discussion, and then build a case on what to do with that sort of information. Okay, so if you listen to none of that part of this uh, conversation, the big takeaway to, to keep in mind is that what we have found through all of this research and space utilization is that, here it is, 70% uh, of the work that is being done today is collaborative, 30% of the work that's being done today is more independent. Now you can argue the, the industry and the part of the country and all that sort of stuff and that's fine. But at the end of the day, this is what we have found through both the quantitative and qualitative data. This is significantly different from when we first started talking about the office in the 1940s and 1950s. That time period, the work that was being done was highly, highly independent work. Actually, it was about 70% independent, 30% collaborative. And so so we have dynamically changed the way that we're working. This is not thought. This is real deal on the street what's happening right now. And so organizations can either get on board with this or not, but the train is sort of moving in terms of this hyper sense of collaboration. And if we think back to that research a long time ago that we saw from the A&D professionals, the state of the workplace, the workplace trends for the US, A&D people believe that it's actually at about 86, 83% of the work that will be done and they think in the next three years it'll be even more. So just keep that in mind in the discussion. Okay? And again, I understand that this changes based on the type of work that people do in industry and all that, all of those caveats. But keep in mind this is this is just where things link. This is around the whole idea of our concept around living office. Okay? So now I am just going to show you some landscapes of putting this process into work, all right? And then we'll get to change management. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So just very quickly uh, in, in this process, so these are about uh, shared seating. So these are, these are, uh, this is a real client, and I want to show you here, this is their, their current space example. They have zero shared seats, okay? Zero shared seats. But the idea is after you do space utilization study work, you find that maybe they could have more shared seating. Um, so you see here that they have only 19% group space. And if we think about the other slide that we just showed you about how 70% um, of the work that's done is more collaborative, but yet only 19% of their space is group space, that's very interesting, okay? Uh, if, 
if it's the exact opposite, maybe it needs to change. So maybe that client doesn't go to 60%, maybe they could go to 32, or maybe they could go to 47% of uh, group space. But if we look at shared uh, seating, if we move beyond this based on utilization, I'm not saying that they go from zero, from no shared seats to 69% of their seats being shared, but could they go to 18? I don't know that they could go to 45, but could they go to 18? So it's just this discussion of being able to provide options for, for, the, for the customer in this conversation. So this is a real client. Um, unfortunately, they had all their private offices all around the perimeter of the building, um, but so not the best for them here. Uh, we did uh, some baseline work for this particular client to understand how many private offices, workstations, et cetera, and then did our space utilization. This snapshot is around conference rooms. We also did private offices for them. So the, the red or the green line in, or the green dots indicate um, more usage of these particular rooms. Red bar indicates less usage of those particular rooms. So from that, in terms of programming, you can build a recommended mix for the client of utilization. Utilization. And so you might turn that space into something that looked originally like this to something that looks like this, which is just a block plan, right? We're not throwing furniture in yet, but it's just a block plan of what could be. So you add in different types of features like hives and jump spaces and clubhouses and all that good stuff, which we haven't talked about, but we certainly can. Uh, so you do this sort of work to tell, to tell the customer from a baseline how you can move from there to a new option in terms of uh, work seats, workstations, et cetera. So this is just what it could look like in the process. Uh, and moving, in this case, the idea was moving from zero shared seats to 32% shared seats and moving from 12% group space to 40% group space to just consider that in the, in the process there, okay? So just some ideas in terms of how your programming folks could have this discussion. All right, so before I get into engagement, any, any questions, anything? I know this is a lot, but I promise this is really good stuff at the end, too, so. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. So um, the, the question is, why is this uh, collaboration work at 70% independent at 30%? One of the things that I didn't talk about in the future of work, the scenario planning, is this term that we're using of interdependence. It's the idea that it now takes, so the average 30-year-old will work on 300 different projects over a 10-year time span at work. I'm not saying that they're the lead on that project. I'm just saying that they're involved in those projects. So that is the reason why this is happening, because now it takes 10, 15, 12 people to move a ball as opposed to one person moving a widget from one place to another. And you all know this, right? You're working, a lot of us work in teams, and so it takes a lot of us to move a process forward. That's why things are, are uh, tend to be happening in this way, because of the complexity of work. The complexity of work um, requires people to work in teams and in groups. And we see this from kindergarten to where things are now. There's a whole sort of argument around the state of education and how people learn and all that sort of stuff, which I won't get into today. But uh, you find that group work is something that happens for most four-year-olds on into university level. And so it creates the situation of um, hyper collaboration um, because they're accustomed to that growing up. All right, yep. Yep. Okay, so here's good stuff around engagement, which is what I like to talk about anyway. So here's what we know. Uh, Towers Watson study, 2012, real deal, factual information. People were actually surveyed at work. So keep this in mind, because I think these numbers could be quite higher, honestly. 65% of people were surveyed and said that they felt unsatisfied with their work. These are either people that felt unsupported, detached, or disengaged, all right? So folks might think in the US, things are just peachy keen, rosy, and all of that sort of good stuff, but actu in actuality, it's even worse. So the uh, Gallup study in March, April of last year, 70% of people that were surveyed at work 
said that they were either uh, not reaching their full potential at work. And these are folks that were either disengaged or actively disengaged in the workplace. So I want us to look at these folks that are disengaged. And I know none of you are these people, but you may work with some of these people. These are individuals that are spreading ill will and discontent in the office, okay? So these are your, I refer to them as Debbie Downers and to not be gender specific, Darren Downers as well. And again, none of you I'm sure are those people, but you may know a Debbie Downer or a Darren Downer. And, and so the idea that folks are spreading ill will and discontent is quite damaging. It is quite damaging to the productivity and profitability of an organization. Believe it or not, that's the truth. So it's a, it's a critical interest in terms of an organization's business drivers to figure out a way to deal with this issue of engagement. So engagement's a big term. What does that sort of mean? It's, it's really about whether or not people are, are thrilled excited or okay to come to work every day. And if they are not, then they will answer these questions in the negative, and that creates a situation where most organizations who have folks that are not thrilled to come to work are generally not profitable or productive. And we can argue that, but in general, uh, folks that aren't thrilled to come to work work for an organization that tends to not have great results in some capacity, either attraction or retention, productivity, uh, profitability, any of those sorts of things. And I know you're thinking in your organizations that are horrible but are very productive, and that's fine. Just sort of think about this for a second. Okay. So the other part that is quite compelling, this is why I said at the very beginning it's nice to have HR people in the room if at all possible because they believe this, they know this, and they're on board with it. So true story, um, HR professionals, 69% of HR professionals feel like engagement is a problem in their organization. 69% of HR people feel like it's a problem in their organization, and 82% say that it's so important that they actually need to do something about it. Oh, goodness gracious, great, right? That they actually feel like they need to do something about it at their organization. So that's why I think it's important to have HR people in the room when we talk about engagement, collaboration, connectivity, because that already resonates with them, and they will be great coaches, great advocates, great supporters, of the process of a great space that's built to support the people in that space. So there's my argument in regards to getting HR people in the room. Um, Gallup also estimates that there is a concern around loss of, or how people that are disengaged connects to a loss in productivity. And they quantify this between 450 to 550 billion dollars, okay? So productivity is also a big word, and kind of what does that all mean? Well, we define, or Gallup defines it based on ideas around KPIs, or key performance indicators. And for them, we don't necessarily need to understand the numbers here. The big takeaway for us to sort of keep in mind as Gallup estimates engagement in terms of productivity, organizations that are more challenged around engagement, so organizations that have folks that are more disengaged, will tend to have problems around quality or defect issues, patient safety if they're in a healthcare environment, general safety issues of their employers, shrinkage, and for me, the biggest issues, turnover and absenteeism, okay? So organizations that around engagement have these particular issues, defect, um, turnover, absenteeism, et cetera. Organizations that have a higher sense of engagement of their folks uh, will tend to be more profitable and more productive. That's Gallup research. That's not ours. It's compelling, so I want to show you that, okay? So this is the whole we need to get on board, okay, because it now relates to numbers for an organization. Now, this is just some, some research of mine that I've been thinking about and, and talking to anybody that will listen. And you're a captive audience, so here we go. So many organizations will use engagement in 
serve, uh, will use some type of engagement survey in their process to find out how folks are, are thrilled or jazzed to be at work every day, their, their engagement situation. Um, some organizations use Gallup, some use Conexa, which is an IBM product, some use Denison, or some will create their own. Uh, and there are others out there, and I'm not, uh, I'm not endorsing any of, any of them. I'm just using my research from, from that, okay? So the easiest one for me, in terms of telling this story, is built on the Gallup Q12, which are 12 questions, that's why it's called 12, Gallup Q question, 12 questions, that Gallup asks uh, sur surveys for their clients around engagement. These are the 12 real questions. And I understand your organizations could use other methodology, that's fine, okay? Um, I'm just looking at these 12 for this conversation. So uh, one question here is, I have a best friend at work. If, if people answer this in the affirmative, they tend to be more engaged. If people answer this in the negative, they tend to either be looking for a job, they are seven times more likely to look for a job or leave their company in eight to 12 months, okay? Honest, Gallup, all research I can provide to you, real deal, study work, they will leave. And it's a best friend, and a best friend matters. And that's his book, Tom Rath, Vital Friends, around how best friends help support issues around trust, anxiety, kind of de-stressing people, makes them feel okay to be at work, sharing problems, all that sort of research behind it. I have a best friend at work, just one of those 12 questions. So my argument in space, if you stuck with me and believe that change matters or um, the, the workspace matters, uh, the thought process is how can I, in my area, in my thought process around the workspace, I believe that we can support, we collectively in the room, can support issues around connection, knowledge, visibility, functionality, and brand. Just my opinion. I want to think about how I can support a greater sense of connection because I believe that I have a best friend at work is about helping people connect, okay? So for Heather and Michael working at the same company, I know they don't, but let's say they do. If I want Heather to answer this in the affirmative, I want to be able to make sure that I don't have lots of turns for her, right? That it doesn't take her so many turns to meet somebody, right? That was my argument before. I want her to be able to, be able to have a greater sense of connection so that when she gets that question, Heather can answer this in the affirmative, okay? So how can I, we, support the physical space that, that creates an idea around connection so that someone can answer, I have a best friend at work, in the affirmative? Um, there is someone at work who, is, who encourages my development, another real question. I believe that's about visibility. So how can the physical place, the actual space, the environment support visibility so that someone can answer this question in the affirmative. Last year, I had opportunities at work to learn and grow. In my opinion, that's about knowledge, knowledge sharing. So how can the physical place, the actual space, support knowledge sharing? Now, I understand that someone's work team leader, lots of other factors go into engagement, okay? And whether or not people are engaged or disengaged in work. I get that. There's lots of factors that take place. But space matters. So my argument here is how can these issues of, of knowledge, of brand, of functionality, connection, support people so that they can answer this in the affirmative, so that we can get people to be engaged in the workplace. Is this going to always be the case? No. Is it going to always happen at 100%? No. But can we build a compelling case around it? I believe I can. And so that's the thought process in terms of at least having the discussion about how the space can support these issues of engagement. And I'm just looking at these 12. Other organizations have lots of different questions, and you can sort of see them. But I just want to, I really want to have that kind of dialogue with a customer about how the space can support these issues of engagement. Okay. All right, so before we get to change management, we can't have change if we don't have a vision. So sometimes people don't have a vision. 
that's concerning, right? So uh, I'm going to give you a little taste of what a visioning process might look like. This is not our actual visioning process. This is sort of a quick lowdown on how you can do it from some research that I did, and so I'm just sharing it with you. Um, typically, our process can be like a four-hour, three-hour time period. We're not going to do that, so I'm just sort of sharing this with you here. So first, we have to know where we want to go, and that's built on a process of vision. I told you this is my kitchen sink presentation, so here you go. Uh, generally, what happens when you start a visioning session is that you might have particular questions, and we all know the answers to these. Is the space being used to its maximum value? No, is generally the answer. Is the space being used to the best way possible to support both the people and the work? Is it accountable to the work? No, or why are you asking that question? Uh, does the space support the way work is happening today? No, that's why I invited you here to come and talk to me. Uh, what's an acceptable target range for space utilization? I don't know. What's happening in my part of the country from family-owned grocery stores in the North Northeast, right? So that's generally what happens in terms of these responses, right? That's never good. But it's important to have this discussion and ask these questions. So when we're thinking about visioning, um, I think that this is all very helpful in terms of putting a strategy together. So the first thing is being strategic in your visioning sessions, and I think it's about prioritizing the goals based on their organizational business drivers or your business drivers, and being able to narrow down those ideas based on performance and importance, performance and importance. So you have to be able to rank those things. Uh, so you do that based on, in this case, impact and, and implementation or importance and performance is another way to say that. And then you have to build this action plan around all of that, right? And all of that it, it makes more sense when we go through these slides here. So one way that you can do this, like this process, um, Again, not a Herman Miller approach, but uh, Stanford Design Institute uses this process, and I like it, so I'm sharing it. One is, uh, it is called I Like, I Wish, I Wonder. And so to have this conversation with your clients or your colleagues um, at your organization, I think is quite helpful in terms of just starting the ball rolling. Again, this is not a professional visioning session that I'm suggesting here. This is just a thought starter conversation. So I Like, I Wish, I Wonder basically goes through three different approaches. I Like, within the current space, is generally what's working well or your enablers okay I like it it's happening now um, I wish that should be negative a minus sign right I wish are generally obstacles that are seen in the current environment these are things that they'd like to change and I wish talks about the possibilities of what could be so it shows an individual's active engagement in what the future could hold for the organization if they don't have anything and I wonder that's concerning and you should move on to someone else that does have a lot of stuff because that shows their level of engagement in the process in my opinion and if they have a lot of I wish and not a whole lot of I like that can also be concerning too so think this is just one approach to the, to the conversation okay not ours but I like it uh, another way to think about visioning in terms of a thought starter is how could we make it blank? And so I'm dissecting this for your junior high sort of diagramming sentences discussion in seventh grade. This is what it looked like, or sixth grade. Linking strategy to implementation is the how factor. So when you ask how, your strategy and implementation. When you ask could, in sentence diagramming, this is about getting you to look to the future. If they say I don't know, then move on to someone else who might know, okay? Then the next part, we, is about the issue of collaboration and connection within the space. So how could we, not how could I, but how could we make it better? This is less about what Bob and Carol want and more about what the organization needs. And then the last part, make, uh, is this sense of a, uh, an active area that you want to really do something about, okay? So I'm not saying that you use both of these. You could if you want. You, could, you don't have to use any of them. I'm just saying that this is a way to kind of get this process starting, envisioning, and what could be, okay? So let's say you do that. Let's say you ask both of these, I like, I wish, I wonder, and how could we make it blank, okay? Then what you could do, could do, is then build a matrix from that, because I want to be able to rank these in order of importance and performance, or in this case, impact and implementation. So after you find out all of those attributes of what they said, based on I like, I wish, I wonder, I, want, I wish it was more uh, collaborative, I wish it was more open, I wish it was more vibrant, or I wish we could make it, um, 
tech focused or you know, technology savvy, whatever those attributes might be. Well, those are all great attributes, but we need to rank them in order of importance because we may not, if they come up with 30 different things, we may not be able to do 30 different things. Maybe we can do 10, 12, 7. And so we need to be able to rank them. So one of the things that we could do is rank them on the difficulty or ease to implement, okay? Or um, the importance of them might be this particular line here, potential impact. I'm not saying that we only focus on things that are easy to implement and most dramatic. Um, it, it may be something that's difficult, but some things that are difficult can be really great. So it's okay if it's, if it's easy or difficult. We just want to understand where it might be in the process. If we want to make a space more technology focused or technology savvy, maybe it will be a difficult process for us. But however you decide to rank it, it needs to be ranked in some way. I like importance and performance because you can, can look at this in terms of what's more important to the group overall and performance tells you how it's being performed today. So if it's a challenge today, then you know from a programming standpoint, then you can reevaluate the space, okay? But it needs to be discussed and ranked, in my opinion. Uh, so then once you do that, you can look in terms of a strategy. The strategy, in my opinion, needs to be understandable. Many times we speak different languages, um, well beyond just English, but the idea of uh, what when I say uh, innovate, that's a new, you know, a big buzzword around, right? Innovative. Innovative can mean 50 different things to 50 different people in the room. So we have to spend a good amount of time, and I did this with a client in San Diego, an energy company. We were there for four hours, and we had to really focus on what the words meant to everybody because they cannot... Um, explain what those words mean to everybody in the organization unless they all speak the same language. So if the word is innovative or collaborative, we all have to understand what that means. And it might, and we all might think, well, everybody knows what that means. Well, it only means that thing to you, generally, is what we find out. It means different things to different people. So we want to make sure that it's understandable. We also want to make sure that you can actually do it, because we should not be having conversations about things that you really can't do. That's, that's uh, creating a path toward action. And so if you can't do it and, and it's not actionable, then, then we shouldn't be having that conversation in the first place. So the other thing that I think is important is the process of alignment. And this is alignment based on not what Bob or Carol wants, but based on what the organizational drivers are. So it has to align. If they say that they want something that is more innovative, more collaborative, more tech savvy, um, more space for energy, all of those sorts of things, whatever those attributes are, we have to make sure that those attributes are in alignment with the organization. So every time we we look at one of those attributes, we have to say, does that meet our mission statement? Or does that meet our five business drivers? You know, whatever those sort of are. And we have to link each of those attributes back to the alignment of the organization. If you don't do that, bad things will happen. So that's my soapbox again for the process of discussion. So any thoughts around visioning? I know that typically, you know, it's a very long process, but those are my little quick slides on that. Uh, the next process is around change management. Big deal, big deal stuff. All right, so when we think about this, again, starting with the end in mind, this is the idea of making sure that uh, we not just minimize that time, but we decrease the depth of productivity loss that will happen, and it's that WIFM conversation, okay? So here's, here's our thought process for today in terms of change management. Um, uh, so in, in some of my secondary research, what we find in general is that you need to have senior leaders, you already know this, on board at the initial stage in the process. And then as you move through that path of change management, they need to be less involved, quite honestly, less involved, and you need more peers to be advocates. This doesn't always happen. Or sometimes you don't have the senior leadership involved in the beginning. That's not good. It's not going to end well. Uh, but if you have them involved at the end, you want them to reduce their level of influence over time so that you have a greater sense of peer influence that happens. This is not just tables and chairs. This is any sort of change management model. That's what happens here, okay? 
Um, the other thing that we think about is that when you do have leaders involved in that process and sort of this stage, this is McKinsey's study, they, um, an organization will be very successful or extremely successful depending on the visibility of that, uh, that senior leadership in that process of the change. Okay? So when they're not involved, bad things happen. When they are involved in the process at the initial stage, good things begin to happen. Not Herman Miller research, McKinsey, but I think it's good stuff. Uh, so the idea here is that you have a great amount of resistance to change, and so you may want to have help people along in that process to help get them on board. So this is uh, Kurt Lewin is a social psychologist. This is all sort of basic change management stuff. It's the opposite end of the spectrum. So enablers that support change are a greater sense of involvement, recognition. When you have measurements, when you have leadership support, I already told you that that was important. When you don't have these things, you have what Lewin calls obstacles. And this is based on fear, mistrust, poor communication. So, so when change goes wrong, it's because you have more of this and less of this. So think of this line here as shifting music mixer bars that may go further along in the process, one end or the other. But you have to really think about what these things are. Uh, what are the fear factors? What are the issues of mistrust? What is the poor communication that's happening? Because if you don't identify these challenges, you, they will never become enablers for you. Okay? So again, basic change management, it's important, so just keep that in mind in the process. So I like to talk a little bit about fear because that generally is the reason why we have issues around change. It tends to be a lot of it is mistrust and poor communication, but a good amount of it is fear. And it's fear that's based on failure. It could also be fear around loss of control, a fear around loss of belonging. A lot of it in terms of the workplace is around loss of esteem or status. I'm losing my private office. Okay? So when it's based on fear, I love this quote, fear is the dark room where negatives develop. I think that's very true. Uh, so keep this in mind. I want us to think about these questions. I just put these questions up here for us to think about. Um, this is a concern around the uh, issues that we need to uh, uh, consider a change management process. Has anyone become abnormally quiet? That's generally not a good sign. Um, what are people afraid of? Why do people feel these fears are justified? And what can the organization do to remove the cause of these fears? So we need to be able to answer these questions. I would think as leaders in the room for, um, at, at the client leadership, we need to be able to, act, uh, to ask ourselves, how do I react when others make a mistake? What is, going, what is my first question when something goes wrong? And we know the answer to that, and so we want to make sure that we're more supportive in this process to be able to have a good dialogue with it, okay? So I think that fear is certainly a concern um, that we need to rectify in terms of the change management process. So the process of change is really the process that one goes through grief and then a vid uh, um, in at some point in time, you move toward this, toward this issue of adoption and, accept, and exception of the, of the process uh, for us. So I think that this is certainly over time, good things will happen. Again, that's your productivity dip there for the organization. So this is, this is our model. I like it. And so uh, I'll share this with you in terms of our change management process. The problem around change is typically related to one of these issues. So the formula here is the V stands for vision. Many times when change uh, is a problem is when folks don't know the vision. So what we find is that executive and director level people will know why we're doing this move, why we're doing the change, but your middle management people and your feet on the street field employees do not know the vision. They may know what the mission is of the organization, but they don't know the vision behind the new workspace, what you're trying to achieve. And you may think that the director level people are cascading that information, generally they're not. So it's important for everyone to understand the V or the vision in this, in this discussion. Discussion, okay? When there is a problem, it's because one of these things. Either they don't have the vision, they don't understand the vision, or two, the K is knowledge. The knowledge are the 250 to 300 different questions, quite honestly, that we have found 
people will ask in the change process. Am I going to sit next to my best friend Carol? Where is the nearest gym? Will you have dry cleaning services? Where is the nearest dry cleaner? Is there a cafeteria there? Uh, what services are free? Is coffee free? Do I have to pay for coffee? Where is the nearest printer? Why don't I get the printer that I had before? Is the printer going to be shared among four people? Is it going to be two on, one, uh, two on a floor? How many printers are we going to have? What kind of um, trash can am I going to have? Will it have recycling and a regular work trash can? All of those questions, quite honestly, there are 250 to 300 that we have kind of dialogued with our customers. Um, we can't go through all of those, but we can prioritize kind of A, B, and C. The reason why you have a problem with change is either they don't understand, someone does not get the vision of why this is happening, or they don't understand the knowledge. Now, someone in the room, when I talk about vision, will always say, well, if they don't like it too bad, they can get their pink slip. So, a pink slip is not a strategy, right, in terms of change management. That's not a strategy. And if that's the way that a, a, an organization might feel, then um, they probably have lots of issues around engagement that we need to have another dis serious discussion about, right? So, pink slip is not a strategy. They need to understand what the, what the, va the vision is of the organization. You also need to be able to answer those 250 to 300 different questions. And I'm very honest about that. They, they need to understand that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I do have that list. You can, you can have that list, um, possibly. So we'll see. So the, you know, these are services that I provide, and so I'm kind of giving you this information. But yes, I can share. I can share some of that list. I, I can guarantee I can share some of that list. But honestly, there's about 250, 300 different questions. And so what we would do is help the customer rank those A, B, C, because you can't do all of that right at one point in time. But sort of figure out what are the most important ones. And it's really those questions. Am I going to be sitting next to my best friend Carol? I mean, those tend to be those issues. Okay, then the third part of this formula is HD, or a healthy sense of dissatisfaction. So someone uh, has to understand, everyone has to understand what they currently do not like about their current space. Either it's so noisy, or it's so quiet, I can't connect with anybody, or I hate the carpet, or the place stinks, it actually smells, um, or I hear rumbling of all the pipes and all of that, whatever it might be. Um, it always floods in the front, and so my feet are always getting wet when I come in. Whatever the healthy, there's lots of dust all over the place. Whatever the, the coffee bar is horrible, or our, um, typically it's um, the break room is disgusting. Is that, that's, a, that's one of them. The break room is disgusting. Um, I don't have enough space to get my work done, or there's too much clutter everywhere. Those tend to be some of those things. So you have to understand what the healthy dissatisfaction, not this place sucks, right? That's, that's just dissatisfaction. You need a healthy sense of dissatisfaction, right? Something that you can change. This space sucks is not sort of helpful in the process, right? In the change management process. So you want to determine what the vision is and make sure that everybody understands that, every single person that's going through the change, every single person. You want to make sure that all of their 250 to 300 different questions are answered. That's the knowledge. And you need to know what Carrie, is that right? No? Christy, sorry, I can't see. What Christy thinks is the current problem of her space. And it's not just her workstation or her office, but the whole space in general of that environment. We have to know that as change agents, okay? We just can't assume that Carrie is uh, unsatisfied with something. We have to really understand what, what it is. If you have these three things, if you have these three things, the perceived cost, or the PC, the perceived cost of the change will matter less. The perceived cost of the change will matter less if you can identify for every single person, not just director level, not just you know, uh, uh, management level, but every single person needs to understand these particular things for themselves. And as change management agents, we need to understand these things as well for them. If you don't have one of these three things, then the perceived cost of the move is going to be paramount for the individual, and they will be pissed about that change, okay? So you have to spend a lot of work over here to make this more compelling than this, okay? All right, so how do you do all of that? 
Well, one thing you can do, in my opinion, that was something that we do in our long sessions, is this stakeholder analysis. And I don't put these faces on here. I just did that for you. But you get the gist of this, OK? So in a workshop, I would suggest, or this is what we can do for you, um, what you would do is a stakeholder analysis. And you can figure out, so for one of my clients, uh, they identified 20 people. Sometimes, most of the time you do this by department, but some customers will actually identify people. Michelle. Uh, and Michelle was someone and, and 19 other people at this one particular client that was not only uh, not happy, she was not supportive of the change, but she was also very active. She was very vocal. So that's Michelle here in this quadrant. You want to know your lower right people, okay? These are people that are active on the right and upset. People that are passive um, generally are on this side, and I care less about them, quite honestly. In the time that you have to work through change, you need to focus on these people who are quite vocal, in my opinion. So first, you have to identify these. Uh, one, one company, it was the merchandising department. All of them were these folks. They were upset about the move, and they are vocal. And so it's important to identify them. And you know who they are, but you have to write it down. At the same end, of the spectrum, you need to know your upper right people. I'm generally an upper right person. Um, but you need to understand who those people are. So those are people that are actively engaged, that are very vocal, and they're super committed to the new change. These are your cheerleaders. Your, oh gosh, you lo they love this. What can we do? You want to know them. Why? Because they are the people that are going to be on your change management team. At one company, um, my client called the, them the a culture club and at another company they called them the G move team because that was the the G was the first letter of their company um, so they have different names so you want to find out who these upper right people are okay because they are your advocates you need them your apostles however you want to call them you need to know who they are so I would identify them by name quite honestly if you can at the same time you better 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 identify your lower right people and many times you don't want to do this. This is an unsettling conversation. This is a roll up your sleeves. People might get upset in the room. You don't care. You have to get to this place. Honestly, I mean honestly, I've had this situation happen quite unsettling in Toronto once uh, where we had this discussion of lower right people. Um, sometimes those, that person was in the room. Um, but many times they're not because they are, they're not engaged in the whole process anyway. But you need to know these people so that you can begin to understand what are the K's that we need to answer for them, right? What are the knowledge pieces? What are they currently, are they dissatisfied about? Any anything in the current space? Do they understand the vision? How can we get them on board with the vision? So it's either a V, a K, or an HD that they're concerned with that we need to fill with them. But if you don't write it down, then you can't do about it. Okay, so soapbox getting off of that for right now. Uh, so that's the idea. So in terms of posts to someone's question over here about, so has this really done anything in the process and putting all of this together? Um, I'm going to give you two case studies. This is a global tech company. After you put this methodology in place, uh, we did surveys and focus groups and interviews with them. And they felt like they had a better alignment of their real estate to their business outcomes and, and a higher sense of employee experience. And we also did engagement survey work with them as well. OK, just one case study. Another uh, case study that we did, this is a global consumer brand. So 23% after doing this whole work, 23% uh, felt like they were working working more effectively, 19% felt like they had a stronger sense of community, and 27% felt like they were more valued by the organization. Those three things matter to me as someone who's studying engagement in the workplace, because in my mind, those three things lead to the Gallup Q12 questions. And, and that links to someone being able to answer the, in the affirmative that they're more engaged as opposed to less engaged in the process. All right. 
So um, if you listen to nothing during this whole presentation, this is my cheat sheet for the end of the day. So I've mentioned now, I think about 20 times, about the alignment with business drivers. And I think that this is the, the way to make this happen. It's also a conversation about right-sizing the space based on the work that people are doing and I feel will be doing five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, not the way that they were working five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I also think that we should consider the issues of mobility and sharing. And you know, people use the term alternative work strategies. I don't feel like it's alternative anymore. I feel like they're just work strategies in the way people are working. So it's not alternative. It's, I mean, we know that because people are leaving their current spaces 80% of the time, 60% of the time. So it's not alternative. They are opting out. They're, they're working in some other part of the landscape. Uh, the, the other thing I think that we need to do is make a financial modeling decision based on their real estate cost, what that could look like. And then if you do anything, I think it's really about being able to pilot and test that space um, to, to be able to understand if this is the right situation. So all of that hogwash nonsense blog posting about the, the, how collaboration spaces are horrible, I, I would argue the third thing, excuse me, is that people did not do a pilot test before they moved into that sort of space or, or because if they did then they would have realized that it may not have worked out for them um, to the way that they needed it to. So I just think piloting and testing is, is quite um, honestly very important in the discussion. So the other thing I think is, so I was in the Boy Scouts, I think it's, um, or Cub Scouts too, I think it's good that we all have a good sense of tools, a good uh, uh, tool belt with a good sense of tools with us so that we can make good decisions. The other option of not having a good, sen uh, good amount of tools, hammer, saw, etc., is that you just sort of roll the dice and see what happens, right? Whatever Bob wants to do. That's not a strategy, and it doesn't help in terms of making this compelling case for, for change here, but it's about being very prepared, and I think that a good scout is always prepared. So um, you can leave it up to chance, or you can actually put some tools together and kind of create a strategy around it. So, so that's what I say to the disbelievers and all of that in terms of uh, putting something together in the discussion.